special guest for an interview today. Her name is also Suzanne and she spells it right. So that's great. Um, we're going to be talking to Suzanne Downing who is in Montana and she's going to give us some insights on being an eBay seller in a rural area. So if you have that challenge, maybe what she's going to explain is going to help you. Um, probably what she's going to explain might help you no matter where you live. So Welcome, Suzanne. Hi. <laughs> okay, so let's start off with, um, tell us a little bit about where you live, what it's like there. So I live in the Rocky Mountains in a valley and it's, you know, about 3,700 feet elevation and we are about 15 minutes from the nearest post office. My town does not actually have a post office. So that's definitely an interesting fact about where we live. And there's a lot of wildlife, a lot of evergreen trees, and a lot of snow in the winter. <laughs> so would you happen to know like how many people per square mile or anything like that? I mean, it's pretty spread out, isn't it? Yeah, it's pretty spread out. I believe we have around 700 people in Houston. And it's a, it's a historical site so we have an actual ranger station and they house pack mules so that's an interesting thing right down the street from us but yeah they're spread out i don't know exactly the the square miles of the the population but we're definitely spread out there's at least five to ten acres between the homes okay and how long have you been selling on ebay i started my store at the end of 2012 and I really got going mid 2013. So it's been about six years. Okay. What brought you to eBay back then? Well, my husband and I drove out to Western Montana on a marketing trip for my previous job and we fell in love with the landscape and our jobs did not allow us to move into a remote area. And I said, we have to figure something out. And I actually stumbled across your videos and I, yeah, I started investigating eBay and I said, wow, this could be our answer to living our dream out in the West. Well, good for you. That, love it when that happens. So is eBay your only job or household income? You said your husband works for the railroad? Yeah, so I have uh, the opportunity to travel with him through eBay, but yes, eBay is my only source of income and he's a seasonal worker. So he's off for three to four months in the winter. So we help supplement that time with eBay as well. So let's talk about your professional background. Cause we know there's people from all walks of life that come to eBay. There's no excuse. I can't do it because, um, because there's just people come to it from all walks of life. So what, what were you before you were an eBayer? <laughs> <laughs> I was a paralegal for many years and after college I worked in marketing. I did photojournalism and a lot of writing for an, a nonprofit in the suburbs of Chicago. And through that I was able to get some business training as well. So that really helps along with the photography aspect of, you know, I was, I just love the camera and I love taking photos. So 
I was familiar with photography prior to photographing products. But yeah, yeah so you just put those skills together and it works perfectly for eBay. Yeah, and I think uh, too, being in the nine to five background, it just was not for me. <laughs> yeah, so this, the switch. I've yet to meet a person that says, nine to five is for me. I love it. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> well, well, some people do. They like the structure of knowing they're, they're going to have those specific work hours. And because with eBay, it's, it's all the time you know, right. um, and especially if you work at home, it's just always there and you're like, okay, I need, I'll list five more things, you know, or I'll do this. And some people just don't want that. Um, they want a job they can leave behind and go home and not think about it, but not us. <laughs> nope. Um, okay. So let's see, I'm, I'm reading your notes here. Um, the biggest question is if you're in a rural area, so where do you get your items to sell? Yeah, that is a great question, Suzanne. <laughs> we have one Goodwill within a half an hour driving distance in all directions. And that is primarily where we source. There's a few small thrift stores, but the prices are very high and not profitable for us. And yeah, so we have one Goodwill and then there's two Goodwills that are about three hours over the pass, which is not always accessible to us. And we hit those Goodwills once a month throughout the summer months, and then occasionally if the weather allows during the winter. Have you ever tried any online sourcing, buying liquidation, pallets, wholesale, anything like that? Yes, actually your eBay arbitrage video has helped me in that as well. And I will occasionally search through, I like to sell athletic equipment. So I'll search women's athletic lots, women's Lululemon lots, and I'll negotiate back and forth. So I would say probably three to four of those lots. I buy big lots, you know, five to $500 to $1,000 lots when I can. Okay. And so you are the perfect buyer for those people who can source in great quantity and then break it out into right. individuals. Um, and you know, back to your comment about the location of your Goodwills, um, I have visited Wyoming and I was shocked at how um, distant everything is. You know, where we were was um, like a, a game ranch for a vacation and it was, two hours to a Walmart yep. and it's so vast and it's everything's so far apart. And for people that have never been out West, they, they don't know, they don't understand how vast it really is. Cause it's, yeah, you can see pictures, but until you're there in the middle of it, it's like, everything is so big and far apart. Um, you know, you, when you plan to go somewhere, do you work in a whole bunch of errands at one time? You don't just jump in the car and go to Goodwill for 30 minutes. You work in a whole bunch of errands, don't you? Oh, yes. <laughs> I do my grocery shopping and, you know, run my errands as well. And it's usually more like two hours at the Goodwill. <laughs> when we go, we make the best of it. Right. So, so many people that do eBay have so much accessible to them and they don't, they take that for granted. Actually, on my YouTube channel this morning, there was a comment on a video, one of my sales update videos about, um, you know, I don't believe your stuff's really selling for this amount. I think um, this doesn't make any sense to me why a sweater would sell for $50 when someone can just go to their Goodwill and just get one right there in five minutes. And I was like, um, that's where your assumption is incorrect because not everybody has a Goodwill within five miles or whatever. Um, right. They just don't think outside of what they do normally and realize that there's, there's eBayers like you. Um, so it's, it's good to see the other end of, um, you know, when eBayers ask, should I sell these in lots? Should I want to liquidate? Should I sell in lots? Who would buy that? And you're that person. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Have, have you ever gotten any lots that had crappy stuff in it and was a problem or is it usually pretty good? 
it's usually very good, much better than expected. And I also, from watching your videos, <laughs> uh, I also will bid on lots. So Lululemon, as you know, is a high-end exercise athletic brand. And I will find lots where they say there's pilling, there's minor flaws, and those are my perfect lots to buy because I have a little pilling thing that I can take the pilling off of the fabrics. And even with, you know, some flaws, like some fraying or tiny little holes, people still buy that for a premium price. Mm -hmm. So it's just the value really is in the eye of the beholder and what you can do with it doesn't have to be perfect. So for those listening, if you have access to a lot of inventory very easily and very inexpensively, this is another income stream you can add to your business. Um, obviously, you're going to get more money if you sell things individually. Mm -hmm. But there are buyers for lots and, um, you know, try it. You just have to try and see what works. Um, I have a video about how to put lots together and what to think about. You want to think about the end user, what they're going to be doing with it. Um, so the lots have to make sense. It can't just be like this big glob of stuff. Mm -hmm. It needs to make sense. Right. So anyway, I'm trying to help you out and get more people to put stuff up there in lots. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, because um, it can work. Um, okay, so you, you plan your trip to go sourcing. You buy from eBay in lots. Do you do any kind of like liquidation or pallets. That's the big thing right now is all these pallets. Yeah, which... I'm definitely interested in learning more about that. But right now, if I scale, I would need some little elves or a team of people. <laughs> so I don't actually have a need for it right now because I do source so much and I, I don't have a problem with getting, you know, things to sell. It's just, you just have to organize it in a way that works for you. Yes. It has to be mindfully thought out and like, okay, Thursday, we're going to go to Goodwill and we're going to hit the, the grocery and the post office and all of our stuff that we have to do and our doctor appointment. And it's just all done at one time instead of sprinkled in throughout the week. Exactly. Okay. Um, well, and I tried selling lots also, and um, I just didn't get enough response to make it worth doing because you really have to scale that business and have people putting lots together and looking over everything really well to make sure you catch all the flaws and that kind of thing so if you plan it out it can be a good business model mm -hmm. no doubt it just takes time and you have to have people to do it right um so what would you okay your house is only like 800 square feet too yes it's, it's a cabin in the woods and our eBay stock is primarily in the cabin loft. Okay. Yep. And you said you are in your camper right now. Yes. Yeah. We have a, a travel camper that allows us to go out to the two Goodwills that are a few hours away and save on the, the lodging cost. It's really been beneficial for us to have it. We can travel around. So let's talk about sourcing trips where you go and stay overnight. Tell us how that works. Cause people may not have thought of that and you don't have to be in a rural area. You could just be in an area where you don't have a lot to choose from. You know, people from Alabama drive to Atlanta and stay a few days, hit all the stores and then go back. Or um, maybe your stuff is too expensive in your area and you can't make a profit. So talk about how you work that out. Well, we schedule in our trips uh, based on the weather, as I told you, and we have our camper. And one of the great things about Montana is their Walmart parking lots are huge and set up for RVs. So we take it full advantage of the free night stay that they give you. We have a generator for the cold months that we can, so we can have some heat. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, so what we do, there's a small Salvation Army that we hit the night before. So we plan it out and we hit that store the night before. And then the two good wills, as soon as they open in the morning, we hit our favorite one first and stock up there. And then we hit the other one. So we're basically getting two full days of shopping in and having some free lodging, just, you know, obviously the gas to get out there, which makes our picking 
really good because we can spend the time. We're not in a rush and we can be very selective on what we're purchasing, especially on that. We look for the half off days. So sometimes we get a day's notice before our trip. Okay. So, um, how much do you buy at a time when you go on these overnight trips? So we try to get at least a hundred items per Goodwill. It's usually more than that. And that will last us, you know, a month. And if I'm by myself, like I said, my husband only helps for the few months that he's furloughed from the railroad, uh, by myself, I really still try to stick to that same goal or, you know, exceed it. So it's a lot of financial planning as well. You need to save, set your profits aside and save for the next trip. And once the money's in there, you know, I'm like a little kid at Christmas, like, woohoo. So then so I'm you, you take the trailer and go by yourself sometimes. Yeah. Good for you. Yeah. You gotta be like that out West. Exactly. No, no, no wimpy women out West. You gotta be tough out there. <laughs> exactly. But, you know, I could see that, you know, if you had other people, you said you don't, haven't come across any resellers where you live, but, you know, for those listening, like maybe there's others around you and you could plan these trips together. And right. because, you know, yeah, you're going to the same thrift stores, but everybody buys different things. And every time I go with somebody, they buy stuff I don't want to buy. I don't want to ship dishes. Yeah. I don't want to ship a whole bunch of breakables. And or they hate clothes and it's like, okay, then I'll do all the clothes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, so you'll go by yourself even. Yeah. Good for you. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you say it'd be like 200 items for a weekend or for one of these trips. Yeah. That's pretty much the minimum that we, we shoot for. Okay. Um, so how are the prices at your Goodwill out West? They fluctuate per goodwill but on average our costs some days it's you know about three dollars or 350 an item sometimes it's 450 an item but i found uh in all the goodwills and thrift stores if we do the half off our average price is always about four dollars mm -hmm. and that's that's right in line with that perfect ebay sale buy it for three sell it for 20 type thing where you yep. just keep doing it over and over again okay so and then you've got the trailer so plenty of room to pile up all that stuff in there and exactly and and one thing i do suzanne it, i don't know if a lot of people do this but since we're buying in such bulk quantities i'm not too concerned about price per item when i'm shopping Right. So for example, if we have a Monday dollar day, you know, I can buy 10, you know, sellable, quick sellable things for a dollar a piece. And then I can buy that high end $12.99 pair of jeans and it really equals out. So the mentality is not when I go in, I don't get overwhelmed with the higher price items because I know it's going to equal out to the $4 that we need. Right. And you've been doing it long enough to know if you buy a pair of boots for 10 bucks and you sell them for 60, that's, that's fine. You don't have to worry about it. So I think, yeah, over time, it's like, how many items did I buy? How much did I pay? What's my average cost per item? You look at it that way. Um, right. And yeah, definitely. If you're starting out, you want to know, you know what, we've been doing it for six years and I used to be very, very strict on looking at, okay, this item was two fifty. this item was $9, you know, but now now that I know the brands and I know the price points, it's kind of just, it's kind of creepy that it's all in my head. I don't know where it's stored in my brain, but you know, I can just, you know, even without a calculator as I'm shopping, I know because I'm so consistent with what I'm picking. Or, or you remember like, oh yeah, I got this that time we went there and remember yep. that day. I, that happened to me the other day. We had a really cold, almost snowy day here in Atlanta. And it was like, the the doors on the goodwill are those sliding doors and they just keep opening and all that cold air is coming in and i'm like this was just like that day back in 2014 when we were at the roswell store and it was sleeting and i was like and i remember what i bought on that trip <laughs> isn't that crazy i'm glad i'm not alone in that because i no. i can recall specific items you know oh i bought this pair of sorel boots here that you know sold for so and so <laughs> like it's like wow it is crazy how the memories stay with you. Yeah. So, I mean, but you still need to put it in your spreadsheet, but right. yep. um, 
it's funny how, or like I finally sold a pair of shoes today. I've had, I know for two years and I was like, oh, thank God, you know, get rid of that. I remember the day I bought those. Exactly. So, and then you won't buy those again. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, not those. <laughs> um, so we're going to talk about some of the challenges of eBay when living in a rural area. So obviously where you get your stuff is the biggest, yes. but you figured that out. Um, so let's see, you said you've got some stores that have $1 Mondays and then half the color tag. You just have to coordinate your trips with the sale days. So yep. that makes sense. Now, um, what about your shipping? Do you, do you have USPS pickup or do you actually go to the post office 15 miles away? Well, it depends on the amount of packages we have per day. I like to do buy it now. So if I have too much to put in the mailbox, uh, I will definitely make a run into town. And our post office mail delivery person is fantastic. And he takes any priority mail, priority packages. You know, I can stuff my mailbox and my neighbor's mailbox are kind of like out past the driveway together and he will actually take boxes so I can fill them you know I could fit like 15 to 20 packages which is ideal and we've built a good working relationship with him which is very important when you live in a rural area uh, because it is a you know it's a person that you're going to see all the time and they do go above and beyond for you out here because they know how tough it is Oh yeah, I remember living in rural Tennessee. I lived there for six years when my kids were real little before they started school. And um, they, they're they great, they do anything. Um, so that relationship with your, your mail carrier, now that I'm in an apartment, we have different ones all the time. They, this is right. like one of those routes that's up for grabs and you don't know who it's gonna be. I can't do pickup anymore because some days they don't get pick up, picked up. I'm two miles from the post office, so it's no big deal to take them there. But um, when you're out there like that, um, like maybe the only person you see all day <laughs> is the mail carrier. It actually can be. <laughs> <laughs> Besides the horse and goat that I take care of. <laughs> So do you have one day shipping, one day handling? I do. I do. So you could literally have packages six days a week. Exactly. Yeah, that's, I mean, you're just keeping up with everybody else. No excuses. You nope. just keep going. Now let's talk about your, your store. I'm going to put a link to her store under the video so you can see what she's selling. Um, how many items do you have in your store? Right now, I believe there's 588 on auction. Okay. You said auction or buy it now? Well, I have them on auction because we were traveling. And so I just relisted the auction items, but it's kind of out of the ordinary for me. I'm so used to the buy it nows. I always have just buy it now. So it's, it's an anomaly right now until I get back and settled. We just came back from Mexico. So That's getting, right. <laughs> yeah, getting reacclimated re to the business mentality mode again. And the cold. You yeah. told me you were going to Mexico and let's do this when you get back. And I was like, wow, from Montana to Mexico, that's a big difference. Perfect exactly. time to take a vacation in January. Yes. Well, we will be doing this again. <laughs> <laughs> so how many average items do you ship a day? Maybe like three or four? Oh no, it's more than that. It's probably eight to 10 mm -hmm. on average, I would say. Good for you. Yeah. Okay. Um, now let's talk about the money part. Um, do you, can you share the profit you make um, either per week or per month? Sure. So we aim for making at least $700 per week. And we, ha we did last year, I did hit that goal every single week and a lot of the weeks I surpassed it. And that's with all of your expenses taken out, you know, the, the final profit at the end of the day. Uh, so that so equals you're about $3,000 a month profit. Yeah. 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 3,000 a month profit. Yeah. Um, and that is profit. Everybody that's not sales. Sales doesn't mean anything. That's not what you can pay your bills with. Yeah. which is what you're doing because this is pretty much your job. 
Exactly. And sometimes, you know, I'll have friends that ask, well, how, what were your sales? You know, I'm like, well, you know, I sold $6,500 of product, but you know, off of that 6,500, I only made 3,200 minus the mileage and you know, the travel expense for us is a little more. And then the cost of shipping, as you know, so they're always super excited. Oh, I can make, you know, and you know, in a month where we hit 10 grand in sales, it's, you know, it seems like, oh my gosh, I just hit the jackpot, you know, $10,000, but it's in reality more like you're profiting, you know, about 55% of that. Right. Right. Um, so do you have, what level store do you have? I have a basic store right now. And I found that that just really works for me. It seems like according to my math and analyzing this that when you can consistently have a thousand items all the time is when that next level store makes sense mm -hmm. have you looked at that yes i looked at the different uh tiers and there's only been one month that well actually one week that i had over a thousand and i did nothing but you know breathe ebay <laughs> And I don't think for me that that would be attainable all the time. It's an every once in a while thing. I'm more comfortable around the 500 to 600 item range of keeping that. That's more realistic for me. Well, and you get to a point where it's like the law of diminishing returns. Just because you double your inventory doesn't mean your sales and your profit's going to double. Right. And um, like, I'm trying to get to a thousand items. Most of them are on my second store, but um, it takes a while. I mean, I've been, I decided on this goal about four months ago. I was like, I wanna see what happens when I get to a thousand items. What does that produce for me? Cause I've never had more than about 400 and now I'm at 600 between my two stores. And it's just a lot of, you gotta keep going and it's, it's a lot of maintenance and you know, you'll get it built up and then a whole bunch of stuff sells, which is fine. You know, and I may never get to a thousand because it's, it's all about what one person or two people can do. Right. And, you know, you can't, you can't get past that point unless you scale your business, do something different, hire more people. You have to change something dramatically to get past a certain plateau. Um, so that's what you're saying is, is 600 is about what y'all can manage. Exactly. Have, have you ever thought like shooting for a higher number just to see if you could get there or is it, it's just all you can do with the 600? Uh, I did shoot for the 1000 that I was talking about. And actually I just did that experiment uh, before <laughs> the Mexico trip and I did a 10 day auction, which is very uncommon for me to do. But I think I, I hit the 1012 items that went to auction and we sold 291 in 10 days. And let me tell you, Suzanne, that was a lot, that was a lot to ship out. It was six hours nonstop of pulling and packaging and we're super organized and super fast. Uh, so that I, the, the payoff was rewarding, but it's not sustainable. Realistic. That's the thing is, is like, I keep coming at this business from different angles. Like, what if I do this? What if I do that? And it seems like for me and where I live and my listing style and how I can source, focusing on higher profit items is going to be the way I'm going to get there, not more items. Because, right. um, and even though I have that virtual assistant service, I list my stuff myself. Um, I, did, I did have them list my stuff for about a year. And I just feel like for my um, teaching and my ideas for videos and I got to be like in the business listing my stuff. Cause that's when all the ideas come. It's like, Oh, I really need to tell people about this. Or I could do a great video on this thing. And so, yeah, you can scale it, but um, it, there's different ways to scale it. You know, are you going to be more picky about what you're buying and look for higher profit items? Or are you just going to like slam it and get to a thousand items and see what happens? Right. And that's uh, segueing into that next thought I had the items that we source we have had to be very smart about that and we do have more fillers and regular sellers so if we go in we'll buy 20 pairs of levi's 
I'll buy, you know, 15 pairs of Carhartt jeans, American Eagles, kind of just some, some regular brands, but I know the sizes to get, and I know that they're going to be a quick flip. So I, I can't always find those higher end items. You know, they're occasional. I'll find the occasional cashmere sweater or, you know, a, an anthropology brand that I, I know to look for. And I do find those items, but to make a living out in a rural area, you cannot, you can't pass up your fillers, even if you're making, you know, $10 profit on that item. And our average, selling price per item is not that high. It, it fluctuates between 16 to $21, mm -hmm. but the frequency of our sales makes it worth it for us. Right. Well, and, and like the jeans, um, you learn what sells better and what, as far as sizes, and then you just remember, um, I know we have a lot of new people watching these videos and this is just like learning to play the piano or, you know, learning um, a sport. It's practice, 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 practice. And um, you just have to do it over and over and over and over again. And then you're going to remember, you're going to remember, oh yeah, Carhartt jackets in a 3X. Those always sell in a week. Or, oh yeah. Um, you know, I even sell some Old Navy items because mm -hmm. they, if it's a certain size or a certain kind of thing um, from selling my own clothes, like, you know, you sell your own stuff when you're done with it or sick of it. Um, but it's like, yeah, when I sell those for myself, they sell really fast. So I'm gonna start buying those on purpose now. So yeah. it's just, it's repetition over and over and practicing and like honing your craft. Um, I, I'm in the middle of making another video called um, not having any luck on eBay or something like that, because mm -hmm. people keep saying, oh, I don't have any luck selling that. Or do you have any luck selling this? And it's not luck. Mm -mm. It's skill. It's it's, um, you know, luck indicates chance. You just happen to sell it. But this is a skill you have to develop. And you've been doing this six years now. So you know those filler items. Yeah. Another challenge too, Suzanne, was learning the new brands in Montana because we're in a, we live in an area where there's adventure people, ski people. There's so many different athletic brands that are specific to a sport. So I would go, when I first got here, I would have my, my phone with me and I saw, you know, a jacket that's Marmot brand and I had never heard of Marmot brand. And so I looked it up and there's, that's, you know, a ski brand an outdoor adventuring hiking it's like brand. base layers and jack i just sold yep. a, a top a few weeks ago that was marmot and it was sold for 30 bucks and i think i paid four dollars for it exactly and then the other one was sims is a fly fishing brand that is everywhere in our goodwills so you know we now sell sims brand and it's a high-end fabric and it's a specialty fabric for geared towards the fly fishermen mm -hmm. and you know, so learning, I still learn new brands every day, different ski brands, different boots. And, and that's one thing that I love. And I would encourage people to do is don't ever think that, you know, it, because I, after six years, I'll just, I'll still learn brands. <laughs> it's well, phenomenal. They keep, they keep coming out. They keep uh, creating new ones. And, you know, then it hits that, that growth level, uh, phase on the product life cycle and then it's like everywhere and then people yep. know it so it's not just Columbia and REI and Patagonia there's so many um sportsman brands or whatever you want to call them um and like uh you know for people on a ranch with horses and cattle and all that stuff they wear outside that's really durable Carhartt um you know L.L. Bean makes some very durable things it, it's not glamorous it's just going to last a long time and they're expensive new. Yeah. And there's also a big equestrian community out here. So when we find equestrian riding pants or specialty brands like carrots, you know, I snag those and they're gone right away. Like they're, you know, three to five days, they're just gone. So equestrian items, but that was also a big learning curve for me because I'm not into the horse community. So I had to learn what brands are these people seeking out? You know, what do people want? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a constant learning thing, but what you've done is the basic bloom where you're planted thing. Um, mm -hmm. Figure out what you have accessible to you 
and learn about it because it's going to be different for everybody. You know, somebody in um, a beach town in Florida is going to know all the beach stuff, the swimsuit brands and all the, the trappings for going to the beach, all the stuff they keep coming up with. <laughs> um, and, you know, there's a market for everything, but it's all about being resourceful and learning what is available to you. Um, back to that luck versus skill thing. If you took three eBay sellers from different parts of the country and sent them to a Goodwill together, they would all pick different things mm -hmm. because they all know different things. So it's just constantly increasing your knowledge and being okay with experimenting. Um, I, I'm sure you've had plenty of fails of things that you thought would be great that didn't work out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there is a, a lot of brands that, you know, at, at first it'd be like, Oh, this material is, you know, amazing. Or Sportiva is a rock climbing, you know, very expensive gear oriented fabrics and brands that is a high end, but it does not resale. And so we've had to learn just because it's expensive in the store, like you have to do your research on eBay because there's a, even a lot of REI items, you have to pick the right ones. Cause there's things that, you know, like a regular pair of shorts, as opposed to a pair of cargo shorts, like there's a big difference. The, the regular shorts may sit, the cargo shorts will go pretty quick. Right. Uh, those, those clothes that convert. Yep. Um, I found something a few weeks ago. It was a uh, mountain hardware jacket and it had these zippers under the arms. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what is that? Why is that there? <laughs> There's supposed to be a lining here. What is this for? And it's like, no, that's so when you get hot, you just zip them, unzip them and you cool off and the air gets in there. So you don't have to keep taking your jacket on and off. There's a name yep. for those. Is, is, is it vented? Yeah, it's it's a ventilation system. I don't know the specific name offhand, but yep. Yeah, it's so it was like, what is what does this do? Mm -hmm. um, okay, that's great. Now I know that. So, um, yeah, there's all the the nuances of the different brands and things, but um, it's just like like keep learning. <laughs> yeah, the other thing too is uh, before I enter a thrift store, I have a strategy for that day based on my mood and what I feel like shopping for. So I'll, sometimes I'll go right to the shoes and I'm super excited to get shoes. And, you know, I'm going to really search through those shoes, every single one, turn the bottoms over in case it, it's a different style than what I'm used to. And it's a high end brand. Uh, sometimes I just feel like denim and I'll just, you know, I'm like, okay, I'm going to get as many jeans as I can today. And, and I go in tears because you get exhausted when you're one person shopping for a hundred to 200 items, you know, I have to take a snack and water and it's an event. <laughs> so you have to like having an actual strategy. So you're not just going in and, and roaming around the store. You want to make really good use of your time. Yeah, exactly. Like if you already have enough shoes, like, okay, they haven't been selling. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to focus on what I need to restock. And, um, I do not live in a rural area, but I do the same thing. When I go, um, I usually go on Sundays because that's our half price day to one of about four different Goodwills in the affluent areas. Um, sometimes it's, you know, 20 miles. I mean, I go to specific places on purpose, but um, I'll have my snacks and my bottle of water and my purse or my tote bag, whatever I'm bringing. And um, I'm in, I've been in there for five hours. Usually it's four to five hours because I'm here already. It's half price. I'm going to keep looking and people don't like to go with me because God, are you ever going to finish? And it's like, oh, I, haven't, I haven't looked at everything yet. There could be something amazing over there that I haven't seen yet. So I'm here yep. or so I'll check out and then I'll go eat lunch and then I'll come back and do another three hours. Um, but that's the way I do it for time efficiency. So I'm not just like running all over the place all the time. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you're in there, you're in that mode. I'm going to find stuff and um, you look for, yeah, you got to be in the mood to look for certain things. <laughs> yeah. I remember uh, one of my, I made it kind of a game. I watched your anthropology brand video and then I went on eBay and I, I typed in anthropology and then I did a search for the recent sales and I looked at the tags. And so I made it a game one time to go to the Goodwill and I was only looking for anthropology and I looked in the women's dresses and then the women's shirts. And 
it was awesome because I came across some labels that I would not have known about. And I looked it up and sure enough, you know, the labels are very am ambiguous. <laughs> and uh, I was able to match a lot of anthropology tags. And that was super exciting because I never would have known that. What is that? Is, there's a phenomenon called the Baden something where you don't real you don't know about something and then you learn about it and then you see it everywhere. It's like, mm -hmm. yeah, you think of a yellow car. Gosh, I never see yellow cars. And then you see them for the rest of the day. You see them all the time. I think that that comes into play of like, well, now you know about it. You probably, or maybe had been look, seeing this before and just didn't know what it was. And now you know what it is and you're intentionally looking for it. Exactly. So you are finding anthropology out there. Oh yeah. I, I just never need to look for them. <laughs> there, there you go. You never know. So it's like, um, so you do clothing and sports equipment and you do like coffee mugs and kitchen stuff too. I used to, and now I just focus on clothes and shoes. And like I said, I have a strategy that I go in tears. So if I have any energy left, it depends on how strong my coffee was that day. I will definitely have the energy to look at the mugs and, and look at, you know, the household items. Uh, I, one of the things that stands out to me is I, I found a city mug from Starbucks that went overseas for a few hundred dollars. That nice. was yeah, that was probably one of my best sales on a coffee mug, <laughs> definitely. And, you know, we see the Life is Good mugs. Uh, I pick those up all the time and maybe some craft items. Uh, I found a bunch of Cricut cartridges that were new in packages that I got for, you know, $1.99 a piece. And mm -hmm. so I think those are all gone now except for one or two. So I do, I do pay attention and look, but like I said, you know, being in a rural area and you only have so much time in a day, I get exhausted, so I have to go in my tears and, and Well, yeah. you could always go out to your trailer and take a little power nap and then go back in. <laughs> Probably what I would do. <laughs> yeah, but they're only open so many hours of the day, so if I spend three or four hours in one and three or four hours in the other, it's, you know, eight hours, and I still, I still haven't made it to some of the men's departments, and, you know, it's just frustrating because I literally run out of time, and our Goodwills in Montana, uh, the one stays open until nine, but the other two are only open till seven. Uh -huh. So that makes it very difficult. And <laughs> maybe yeah, I should. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's like the opposite problem with in a city area, because you is still you're overwhelmed with how much stuff there is to look at. You're like, well, I could go to this one. And then on my way home, I could hit that one. It's like, yeah, who am I kidding? I can't do two in a day if I stay that long. <laughs> yeah. It is definitely, you know, we're all only human and yeah. you can only do what, what you can do. And so even though you're in a rural area, you're already, you're saying um, there's this stream of stuff is endless. I mean, it's, it's never going to stop. If you can figure out where to go get stuff, um, you know, people aren't going to stop donating stuff and cleaning out their houses and downsizing and I mean, where I am, I think there's four different storage unit facilities being built right now. I mean, oh, they wow. just keep getting built everywhere because people have so much stuff. Instead of dealing with their stuff, they're putting it in storage. Well, at some point, it's going to have to come out of there, you know, 10, 15, 20 years from now, whatever. Um, so it's, it's never a matter of finding stuff. It's, it's the time you have to put everything up for sale and deal with your business and ship everything and all that. Yeah. Another thing on time too, when you do have, uh, you know, I'm, I'm buying in so much bulk that you can get overwhelmed with, with actually taking the pictures and listing them. So I'm very organized and I put always put like items with like items so that I can do a batch of 10 at a time and I can take okay, these are all, you know, Nike pants. These are all Columbia convertible pants. And the listing goes so fast. And I've learned to be just so efficient. You know, I don't, I don't think it's, it's worth people's time really to go back and forth and back and forth. If you have like items, like that's one of my biggest tips is just be organized. And, and when you're listing, list with a purpose so that you can make the most of your time. Yes, because like if you're doing all skirts, then it's like you're in that mode, you're in that flow of that type of item, you're mm -hmm. taking pictures of them, 
which to me is the part that's the most exhausting, really. I think that's more exhausting than shopping. <laughs> yeah. It's it definitely, um, I always tell people, if you want to, if you want to sell on eBay, you need to start doing squats. <laughs> Yeah, because like shopping, you're all motivated, like what's the next thing I'm going to see and find and what's it going to be? And there's stuff in here waiting for me to find it. It's so exciting. Um, and then it's like taking pictures is I got to put on a movie or something mm -hmm. to keep me company. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's very physical. It's a lot of moving around if you're doing clothes, especially. Yep. Um, and, and some things are really heavy. You know, the men's jeans are really heavy heavy and jackets and that um snow wear stuff i did sell a pair of obermeyer ski pants a couple of weeks ago which i found last summer in a thrift store in atlanta and i'm like i know this brand somebody's gonna buy this and it did it went up north somewhere so right. um but yeah that outdoorsy stuff can be very heavy to deal with mm -hmm. yeah so it can be exhausting so you kind of alluded to this, but you don't really outsource anything. You and your husband do everything yourselves. Yep. <laughs> I did at one point, uh, before we moved to Montana, I, uh, one of my daughter's friends, you know, was looking for some side money and I would, I would buy in bulk jeans and she was my jean photographer. And I taught her, you know, the ins and outs of eBay as a way for her to be an entrepreneur so she could see every different facet of the process as well. And that worked out really well because she had the energy and she was super fast about it, but there's not anyone out here <laughs> that, you know, I have met so far. And I think to drive out to this area, it's, it's an older demographic. So to find, you know, a younger college kid or high school kid that wants to make the commute is, it's really not ideal <laughs> for me, but you know, so I just, I just make it work. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's what you have to do. And you've done a great job um, bringing in 2,500 to 3,000 a month yep. in profit. Now, are you set up as a sole proprietorship? Yeah, I'm a sole proprietorship. Okay, so just for tax reasons, you just file that in with your regular taxes and take your expenses and all that. Yeah, we do the, the standard 1099K and Did then it. the Schedule C. Easy enough. So for people wondering, it doesn't have to be complicated. Um, mm -hmm. I don't talk about tax stuff because I'm not qualified. Um, I'm not trained in that area. It changes so much. I would never say anything on a video about taxes because three years from now, six months from now, it could be different. Mm -hmm. um, so if you have questions about tax stuff on your, your eBay business, please contact a local CPA. You can call your chamber of commerce to get recommendations, ask other entrepreneurs who they use, like a restaurant owner, somebody you know and trust, like, hey, who's your CPA? Because they'll have one. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the only thing I'm gonna ask you is that um, yeah. you just, just goes in with your regular taxes. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't have to be set up anything special, uh, EIN or anything like that. And I did that for many, many years, so it's not hard. Um, so, wow, we've covered a lot of stuff here. Is there any, um, is there anything else you'd like to add that we didn't talk about? Oh, I think I'm good. Unless you have any other questions for me, I just, I, I just think would encourage people to just keep researching and keep learning because it's never ending and there's always going to be something to sell. You know, for me, there, there's no excuses to go. I never go into a thrift store without buying something, you know, there's always going to be something to make a profit. You know, you could just be resourceful and work with what you have in your area, you know, just, yeah, and, and it's just like, it's, it's like the unknown. Um, people are like, Oh yeah, my thrift store is not going to have anything. Well, you don't know that. Um, you know, that old crappy half broken lamp could be exactly what somebody wants. Cause they want to make something out of it. They, they want, um, you know, like St. John clothing that's stained and has the buttons torn off. Well, somebody, you just don't know. I sell damaged, defective stuff all the time. Um, you just have to look at it the right way. Things don't have to be perfect. Um, in fact, I would imagine you sell a good bit of outdoor, outdoorsy stuff that's not because they're just going to be wearing it out in the mud to take care of the cows or whatever. It doesn't have yep. to be perfect. 
Exactly. And, and also too, a lot of people say, well, I don't have the time to research or I don't have the time. And, and I will watch your videos while I'm listing on eBay, you know, or while I'm taking photographs. Uh, I'm at the gym walking and I, I can just put the video on and listen. I don't even need to be watching it, but I'm still absorbing the content. And, you know, even if you get one or two brands or one or two tips out of it, you know, over the years that, that all that knowledge is actually in your brain and you're retaining it little by little. So it's, you know, just a matter of on your commute to work, you know, put in a podcast, put in one of your videos and just listen to the audio. So that's, it's really, there's no excuses for not doing your own research and, and you have to have that drive and that will to want to learn. And, and then you can apply that. And once you see the benefits of it, it's, it's just awesome. It never gets old when something sells. It, it's, I love it. <laughs> it just never gets well, old. And you never, um, it never ends. Because, yeah. Um, and it can be overwhelming when you're learning. It's like, oh my gosh, there's so much to learn. I'm never going to learn all this. Well, no, you're not. It's just like when you go into a library and you're like, I'm never going to be able to read all these books. There's just way too many. And next week there's going to be more. And you just do what you can do and find that flow and get what you can get out of it. But um, I think that's why so many people stick with it is because it can always be new and different. If you, if you get out of your little comfort zone, you know, and try some new things, that's where the growth happens is, is it's a lot of trial and error, but you know, success is often disguised as failure. <laughs> a lot of failures in a row <laughs> exactly <laughs> and then you get it well we're going to put a link to suzanne's store under the video and um she'll be on youtube if you have any questions that you want to ask her about anything i'm sure she'll answer your comments but um i just wanted to show you guys that i live in a rural area is not an excuse there is a way to do anything if you want to do it badly enough and and she's proof so thanks, Suzanne. Thanks for joining us. I appreciate you doing this interview.